Hey everyone, welcome. I am the Electrical Code Coach. I'm super excited about today's video. We're going to be doing the Pool Bonding 101 video. I have to recommend before we get started, don't repeat anything in these videos. Just use them for educational purposes only. And today we're going to be diving in the basics of pool bonding. And this may be a lot of review for you, or it may be all brand new to you. But I find that when I go back and review, I get that little piece that I missed, that little bit that just makes me that much sharper when I am out in the field. Today we're going to be talking about equipotential bonding. We're going to learn why we bond. We're going to learn what to bond. And we're going to learn some methods for bonding. First, let's clarify what we're talking about here. We are talking about permanently installed pools. That is actually a dot two definition. It's in 680.2 and it is a definition. So this is any constructed uh, in ground or partially in ground pool. So I live in East Tennessee and you might have a quote flat yard, but part of it's on the backside of a hill. So if part of your, un, you know, above ground pool goes underground, then this is going to be classified as a permanently installed pool. Also, any pool that's capable of holding greater than 42 inches of water. So it doesn't even have to be filled at that point. If it's capable of holding greater than 42 inches of water, it's classified as a permanent pool and all pools inside of a building. And one thing I love about this, if you read there in 680.2, this is even if the pool inside of the house does not have electricity run to it, it still is classified as a permanently installed pool and you have to follow all of the 680 you know, codes that we have to follow that we're going to learn about here today. So super excited about this while we're waiting. If you want to hit that thumbs up button, hit that like button. Let's get to it. All right. So for the majority of our time today, we're going to be in 680.26. That's in the 2017 version. It may move around a little bit in future versions, but it's all going to probably be the same because it's been the same for a very long time. So now we're going to learn about equipotential bonding. Everything that we're trying to do with the bonding is to reduce the voltage gradients, which AKA just means reduce a potential difference. And that's exactly what we're going to do with this equipotential bonding that we're going to be learning about. So we're going to learn what it is and why we do it. So what is equipotential bonding? So equipotential bonding is the thought that we can bring everything in an area to the same potential, the same electrical potential. So we want it to all be the same. If it's all at zero volts, we want it all at zero volts. If it's all at one volt, we want it all at one volt because the danger in electricity is that if there's ever a difference in potential. If I have 120 volts on a hot lead and I have zero volts on the earth and I get in between them two, I become the light bulb. So let's talk about this equipotential bonding and really what I'm going to call for today the equipotential plane. All right, so we're going to say this is the circle of our pool. We're going to say this is the pool water and we're going to say that is the metal pool siding. This is our pump. We're going to say this house is, uh, you know, a little high class. It's got a heater <laughs> and it has a metal ladder. All right. And we're going to say that it has some metal fencing around around the area around the pool. Now, what we're talking about here is we want to bring every one of these points, every single one of them. Let me get my pointer out here. So we want to bring the heater and its associated equipment if it is required by code. And we're going to learn about that in a little bit. We want to bring the pool pump. We want to bring the pool water. We want to bring the pool siding. We want to bring any metal fences within a certain distance that we're going to learn about. We want to bring metal ladders, pool lights, all of these different components. If you have a gas fixture inside the pool or next to the pool within a certain amount of distance, we want to bring all of these places to the same electrical potential. If they all have zero volt, if one of them has zero volts, they all have zero volts. If the pool pump for some reason had three volts leaking on it, we want the water to have three volts on it. We want the metal fence within so many feet to have uh, three volts on it. So there's no difference in potential. You know, they say that anything 30 volts and above is considered deadly. That is when you're dry and in perfect conditions. When you are in the water, they say as little as four volts is deadly. 
So we have to be super careful to make sure that we bring everything to the same potential. We're going to learn more about why as we go. Now, this seems like we've covered everything, doesn't it? But one of the most important places that we want to bring to the same potential is actually the surface surrounding the pool. So the literal surface, whether it's concrete, uh, you know, some type of aggregate, whether it is the grass, we want to even bring that to the same potential. So if there's three bolts on the water, there's three bolts on the ground around it. If there's three bolts on the pump, there's three bolts on the metal railing nearby. That way, at no point can anyone dealing with the pool, whether in the pool or adding chemicals to the pool, can they ever be at a difference of potential if voltage were to leak. Now, you might ask this question, well, shouldn't a GFCI trip, shouldn't a breaker trip? Well, yes, they should, but do they always? Do they always trip? Do they always function correctly? They don't, and that's why we want to make sure, and we could be getting voltage from somewhere else that has nothing to do with the GFCI or nothing to do with a pool. So it's super important that we bring this entire area up to the same electrical potential. That way, if there is voltage leaking, there's no difference in potential. All right, so the first thing that we need to learn is what must be bonded. And the first thing we're going to consider is circulation systems. So this is going to include, but not limited to, pumps, heaters, water treatments. It's also going to include your pool shell, your pool covers. Basically, anything to do with the integral workings of the pool is likely going to have to be bonded. We're going to see in a little bit that there are some exceptions to this, but as we all know, the NEC stands for National Exception Code, which I understand why we have to have to have exceptions and why we have exceptions at all. So the second thing we have to bond is all fixed metal within five feet out and 12 foot high. So the easiest way to imagine this, and that's the green circle that I've got right here. This is our five foot mark. So anything five foot out and 12 foot above the water in my opinion. So five foot out and 12 foot above the water. And if you read it closely, if in that five feet there are platforms that are higher than water, it's my opinion that it needs to include the 12 foot above the highest platform. That's the way I read it. So anything within 12 foot of that highest platform or the pool water, if you're over the pool water, is going to be required to be bonded. Five foot out, 12 foot high. This is going to include ladders, railings, posts, fencing, fixtures, lighting, gutters, doors, frames, metal fittings, all kinds of different things. So with that being said, we're going to want to bond any fixed metal within that perimeter. This is also going to include any lights that are inside the pool, you know, of course, if they are required to be bonded. You have to bond the pool water. This is not one that you would think of and one that they did not do for ever in a day. I, <laughs> Unfortunately, we were blessed. No one ever got hurt. We literally... <laughs> swam in a we didn't have anything growing up but we did have a, an above ground pool somehow it was four foot high and there was a hundred foot extension cord running the pump that was not gfci protected nothing was bonded the water wasn't bonded the the pool wasn't even on gfci protection and only by god's grace are we still here to be able to teach this lesson today but with that being said one thing that they never thought to do until recently uh, is to bond the pool water you have to bond the pool water because the most dangerous place is when you're drenched in that water as little as, little as four volts could be deadly. So if the metal railing around your pool somehow had voltage on it and you went to go rest on it with both of your arms and the pool water wasn't at the same four volts, you could be killed immediately. You could be shocked, electrocuted. It could be the worst case scenario. Also, the surrounding surfaces. So you have to bond the surrounding surfaces. Like I said, whether it's some type of aggregate and you bond the soil underneath whether you're just bonding the grass, and we're going to teach you guys about that in just a little bit, or you are doing concrete or the earth or reinforced steel around. All of it's required to be bonded. We want to bring that outer rim. So if you're resting your arms, if you're setting down and dangling with your feet in the water, we want to make sure that you're at the same potential so you can enjoy that 80 degree and sunny day without anyone being hurt. All right, so now let's learn how to bond it. First, let's start with circulation systems. So let's deal with pumps. So when you're dealing with a pump, if we look right here, here's a normal pool pump. And if you pay close attention right here is actually going to be the lug that you'll ground it with. You'll actually take your number eight and you'll run it directly to it. These are pretty simple. Now, there are some pumps that are not required to be bonded. But if you are the one doing the pool install, you are still required 
to take a number eight whip and leave it over there curled up just in case someone ever comes and they change that pump out and it's not double insulated and they're required to bond it. So that's something that we have to watch out for. It's just got a lug on it like that. It's nothing fancy. It's literally just a lug with a uh, screw through it. It's usually threaded because sometimes you have to, you know, unthread it and move it around to make it fit your direction that you want it to go. But you literally, it's just a lug screwed in and then you'll pass your number eight conductor through that tumbler right there and then, you know, screw it down with that tumbler. Now let's take a look at heaters. And this one you got to look a little bit closer, but this is a pool heating system. And if you look down here, there's actually the ground lug right there. Now there are provisions in the code where you do not have to bond some heaters. You're going to find that in 680.26 over there in pool heating systems under circulation systems. So with that being said, you're going to, I encourage you to read the entire section. Don't go just off of what we're saying today. You need to read this entire section and know it. But some pool heaters you do not have to bond, and I want you to get in there and figure out if yours doesn't. But just assume that it needs to be bonded, especially if you see lugs present. You definitely need to pull out your instructions and your paperwork in order to you know, make sure that you're following the manufacturer's instructions on this. Now let's talk about the pool shell itself. The way that you'll bond the pool shell itself, if it is metallic, is oftentimes we will bond right here. You know, these are mechanically fastened to the outer shell. As long as they are all bolted tight, that is considered bonded. You know, back in 250.8, we learned the methods for bonding. And then we'll usually take one of these and we will often tap it. And we're going to learn how to tap here in just a little bit. So I want to mention that when we're talking about perimeter surfaces, metal pool sides, concrete block, porous concrete, sprayed concrete, and alike are all actually considered conductive surfaces when you are dealing with pools. So they are considered conductive. When you're dealing with concrete, pool, pool sidings, concrete block, all these different things, because of the porous nature, they're considered, when they're wet, they're also considered conductive. So we gotta make sure that we're, you know, it's a part of our equipotential plane. All right, now let's learn about all metal within five feet out and 12 foot high. And just to recap, that is 12 feet from above the water. And also, in my opinion, because of other parts in 680, that's 12 feet above any platform that's in within that five feet. So basically anywhere 12 feet above from where you're at within five feet out and 12 feet above the water. So the highest water level that is capable of being achieved. Then this is going to include things like ladders, railings, posts, fencings. Fixtures, lighting, gutters, so on and so forth. We're going to go through some of them now. And this is, you know, just a typical metal ladder. And this one would be a fixed ladder. And you may see that there is a bonding lug somewhere right in here on your model. There may be a bonding lug somewhere around these feet. You may have to tap it yourself and add a bonding lug. Or you may have something like this that is, you know, types of coping that you're going to use for railing and for ladders. And they're likely going to have some bonding lugs built directly onto them. Let's go ahead and take a look at some other things. This is going to include railing, fencing, gas fixtures, whether they're inside of the pool or outside of the pool. If they're within that perimeter, you're going to have to bond those. Also, it's going to include light fixtures, not only pathway light fixtures and post lights, but any light fixture that is inside of the pool that is required to be bonded in 680. It's going to include things like gutters, in my opinion. You know, if someone were to be standing in the pool or on the pool deck and they were skimming and they had a long skimmer and it tapped a gutter. And let's say the gutter had voltage on it, which I have seen before where, you know, uh, gutter guys have shot through and shot into a circuit and they had 120 volts standing on the gutter. Or one time I was actually on a job and it was the it was the strangest thing ever. It was the inside blower to a wood stove was leaking current and was not properly grounded, which was connected to the metal roof, which was connected to the gutter. So the guy, the homeowner got shocked off the gutter and I spent hours out there. And right before I was getting ready to get up, I was going in to tell the homeowner, hey, I don't know where it's coming from. We're going to have to keep looking. And right as I saw it, I looked over and I saw that thing and I unplugged it and immediately the fault went away. And they just needed a new blower motor. So the, you know, the, the danger of the 12 foot high and the five foot out with a pool is if someone were to accidentally smack that gutter, either with their hand or with a skimming, you know, utensil or some other pool utensil, 
that they could be at a difference of potential either because the gutter or because the pool's at a different potential. And when they touch it, the gutter's at a different potential and it rides through the skimmer or some object or touching them. So that's just one thing to consider. Another thing to consider is door frames. Now, you have to work with your inspector on what door frames they want bonded, but this one here is a really good example. If someone were to touch that, I assure you they would be at a difference of potential. So if that's within five feet of that pool, that's definitely going to have to be bonded as well. Now let's talk about metal fittings, which I thought this was very interesting. It says metal fittings must be bonded unless they are less than four inches in any dimension and do not penetrate the pool structure more than one inch. So that's giving the implication that if it does penetrate the pool structure more than one inch, it doesn't matter what size metal it is, it has to be bonded. But if it's less than four inches in any dimension, and a good example in my opinion might be a valve. Let's say you have PVC piping and you have a metal valve, like a metal ball valve. Well, if you measure it in any one of those four, you know, any of those dimensions and it's more than four inches, it looks like here that it would have to be bonded as well. But let's give a good example of what's not required to be bonded. And that would be something like this in my opinion. So the, you know, the strap holding the conduit up, this is just a metal one hole strap. Would it, could you imagine having to go through and individually bond every single strap to the number eight conductor that you use for bonding? It would be pretty laborious and probably outrageous. So this would be a good example of something that, in my opinion, would not be required to be bonded. Now let's talk about conduit here. So we have a excellent example of conduit being run underground here. You could tell they chose rigid metal so they didn't have to dig very deep. In this circumstance, it would likely only be required to be six inches because of the rigid metal conduit. But in my opinion, because of conduits being required, it would not require to be bonded until it breached that five foot mark. So then you would have to use a listed clamp to get around the pipe and attach it to the number eight bonding. And that's in my opinion. Listen, you're going to want to listen to your electrical inspector and definitely make sure you pull a permit on every pool that you ever do and have them inspected regardless. But this is a good example. Any conduit, if you had a rack of conduits, they would have to be bonded together either with some type of bonding bushing and a number eight jumper, or they would have to be bonded together, you know, underground or exposed. You could just take a piece of number eight and a bunch of pipe clamps and go from clamp to clamp to clamp to clamp, and then boom, jump over and tap onto your, you know, bonding and circling that you're doing for this pool. And now let's talk about bonding the pool water. And this is probably one of my favorite parts here. So if we have a ladder that's like this, that is a permanently installed ladder, where at no time the water will come out of contact with it at least nine square inches, it can count as your water bond as long as that ladder has been properly bonded. Same thing with a railing. As long as it has been properly bonded and it's permanently installed, it cannot be removed, then it is going to be allowed to count as your water bond. As long as there wouldn't, wasn't, if I was an inspector and I was looking at it and it was coated in something or coated in plastic, it's going to have to be metal on water, at least nine square inches in contact with the water. And listen, this does not count for ladders or railings that are removable. Now, you may still have to bond those if they're metal, but it would not count as your water bond. If you do not have one of those, you can use a fitting like this. And if we take a look at it, these are typically one inch, I think. And this part's actually going to go down into the water. And this, it's basically a split bolt on top of it that you'll run your number eight conductor to. And it's going to look something like this when you get done. Now, this is one that has that one inch fitting built in, but you can buy a, I think this is inch and a half pipe by inch and a half by inch and a half T, and then they sell another fitting that accepts this that you can glue it into. So however you accomplish it, just as long as you accomplish it. And the biggest thing that we want to make sure of when we are bonding water is that it's always in contact with the water. And let me explain what I mean. You would not want to install this fitting right here where it would ever not be in contact with the water in the instance of a backwash or in the instance of a routine maintenance. You always wanna make sure wherever this is plumbed in, that no matter what the user is doing with the pool, this stays in contact with that water. And the reason is, is that you could leave people in the water, you know, they're backwashing the pool or they're working on it. You could leave in the, the people in the water unbonded and they would be outside of the equipotential plane while they are in the most you know, dangerous situation of being fully submerged. So another way that you can do it is with something like this. And this one's going to go into a skimmer. It looks like to me that this part lays inside of the skimmer. And this looks like a rubber washer that's going to poke out of the skimmer basket. And then this part here is going to be where you connect your number eight. 
and it looks like it's going to be on the exterior of the skimmer wall when you get finished. Here is a fancier version. Looks like it comes in through the bottom and clips in with the diode, and it's likely going to have the lug over there to, for you to attach your number eight. But whether it's a skimmer, a ladder, or it is one of the water bond fittings, you have to make sure that it's in constant contact with the water, and the code states that it must be a minimum of nine square inches. All right, so let's talk about our final section, and that is the surrounding surfaces around the pool. This is going to include concrete, earth, different types of aggregate. We have to bond the surrounding area to bring it into the equipotential plane. Now, we're going to be talking about, for the next few minutes, above ground pools or pools in general with no poured surroundings. So this is like if there's just earth or some other, you know, they're wanting to do stones or some other type of aggregate around it. So what we're going to be required to do is literally dig a ditch four to six inches below the subgrade and that's for you and your inspector to work out what the subgrade is it has to be in between 18 and 24 inches away from the pool and it must tap need to tap at at least four points for conductive pool linings and pool surfaces this is including you know out of the metal rim around an above ground pool or if you have an in ground metal pool or a concrete pool all of these are going to be considered conductive for the purpose of pools. So you have to tap at at least four points. So now let's walk you through a real life scenario if we were bonding an above ground pool. Let's talk about bonding an above ground pool. We're gonna imagine that this red ring is our five foot mark. And we're gonna start over here at the heater. We've deemed that our heater is required to be bonded. So I'm gonna start at the heater. I'm gonna dig a four to six inch deep trench and I'm gonna come over to the pool pump. Then from the pool pump, I'm gonna head over to the metal rail. We're going to assume that this entire shell has been properly bonded together. If yours is not, your inspector may want you to tap more than four points. But in this case, we're going to say that it's all properly bolted together. It's one continuous rail. So from there, I'm going to dig four to six inches deep, 18 to 24 inches out, and I'm going to do my spider web out. Now you are literally digging down into the ground. And what you're doing is, is you're digging a trench to lay your number eight copper wire in. Then when you get your copper wire up to this point, you're going to go ahead and tap there. Then from there, you're going to jump over and tap the fence. And this is a good time to ask the question, is this all required to be a continuous loop of wire? And the answer is thankfully no, it's not required to. You can use a listed fitting to split bolt or another means to tap onto that and then just do a little jumper over to the fence. Then from there, we're going to come down to point three and then we're going to come down to point four. And while we're there, we're going to tap the metal ladder. Now, if this metal ladder was going to be permanently installed, non-removable, this could satisfy your water bond. If it is not, you would just apply a water bond fitting. And then from there, we have to be sure to go back to our original starting point or at least encompass the entire pool. Now, the next part that I'm getting ready to show you is not a code requirement, and I'm not even telling you to do it or not to do it, but definitely, if you do do it, make sure your inspector's okay with it. But what if we went around the heater and around the pump? And the reason I say this is because if I'm over here putting in chemicals and the metal railing's right there, I'm at the danger of being at a difference of potential if one of them's not bonded. But am I at any less of danger if I'm over here flipping switches back washing the pool i don't know you know all of this is all at the same potential the metal frame of that and the metal frame of this if i'm standing over here squatting or kneeling down or adding chemicals or backwashing i'm not of any less danger of being at a different potential over here than i am over here so that's just something to consider definitely work with your electrical inspector on all of these installations. Let's walk through the underground pool bonding scenario one. And there are a million different scenarios that you could run into when you're doing underground or even above ground pools. Now, everything we're getting ready to bond does not exclude everything else that you're required to bond in your scenario. I'm just showing you what's in front of the screen. So let's say we start over here at the heater and we go from the heater to the pump. Now we're going to go from the pump to the grid. Now we're going to call this a gunite pool where this entire thing is one web, including the bowl of the pool, all of the floor. It's all one giant web of, uh, you know, tied together rebar. So it's all tied together. So with that being said, it's required to extend out at least three foot. And we're going to cover that here in just a minute. But with that being said, for this pool scenario one, we're going to imagine that it's all just one giant piece of rebar bonded together. Now, some inspectors, if this is the case, 
may only require you to come over here and bond right here and let that be the bond for this entire thing. Other inspectors still may want you to do the one, two, three, four points, and we're getting ready to talk about when you must do it here in a minute. But some inspectors, if it's an entire rebar pool, including the floor, the entire thing may be satisfied with you bonding just right here to satisfy this part. Then, of course, we're going to assume that this diving board has to be bonded. So in that scenario, they would let you just tap off that grid to there and then tap off that grid to the metal fence. Now, your inspector may still want you to do all four parts, even if it is solid steel. So make sure that you ask your electrical inspector. Now, let's look at the second scenario. All right, let's look at scenario two. So in scenario two, we're going to say that the uh, steel rebar does extend three or more feet, but it's with a conductive pool shell that is not physically attached to all this steel, not in the same way that a gunite pool is. So with that being said, you're going to have to do your four points. So you're still going to have to make sure at some point that you physically connect to the steel as well. So it's going to be another point that you have to bond. So you'd bond the heater, the pump, then you would bond at your four points at the same time bonding to this steel. And the code says here that the steel ties that they use to tie this all together is equivalent for bonding on that part. And then you would also have to jump off of the copper part of this grid or some part of this metal, depending on your inspector, and bond this diving board and then come over here and you'd have to bond the metal fence. So there's several different scenarios here that we're talking about, and it's just one of those things that you definitely want to work side by side with your electrical inspector the entire install. You're not a bother to them. They want to help you and they want to see you win. Okay, let's take a look at some methods for bonding. So if you look here, this is a very popular one. This is one, and there's nothing you know amazing about this. I love this little one right here. Looks like a 1970s special, doesn't it? That looks like an old school one. And then you have this is the way that you know one method that you can use to clamp to the rebar, and then split bolts are the most popular. But we're going to talk about the two most popular types. One of them is a going to be just a lug that you use. You're going to come right here. We're going to learn all about the methods to you know connect this physically to whatever you're wanting to bond. But it's a real simple apparatus. You connect it right here. Then you come over here. You back out your screw. You run your number eight through it. Then you screw it back down and you're done. So this is a real easy way to do it if you're just wanting to bond things that don't have their own pre-built lugs. Now, the number one way to extend the wire in any manner is with one of these split bolt connectors right here. It is super easy. You literally unscrew them, run your number eight through it, or if you unscrew it completely, it becomes two pieces, and you can slide it on an existing piece of number eight, smush another piece of number eight under there with it, and you could run over and tap your fence or tap what you, whatever you have to tap. The only thing that we have to make sure that we watch out for with any of these fittings, for one, that they're listed, and for two, that they are rated for direct burial and rated to be installed inside of concrete if you're using them in concrete. That's one thing that your inspector is going to look for, that they're rated for direct burial and that they're rated for use for concrete if you're using concrete. Finally, ways to attach the fittings, because if we don't know how to do what's called tapping, then we're never going to know how to do it. So this is what we're talking about attaching if you're having to put your own lug on something. You can use a tool like this. This one's from Klein. And it is a tapping tool. But the thing that we have to watch out for here is that we must engage at least two threads of whatever we are wanting to you know, use to screw in. So with that being said, you can use one of these hand type ones or you can use a type that goes in a drill. But that metal has to be thick enough to engage at least two threads. Now we're allowed to use any of the methods really that are listed in 250.8 and one of them being if you use a tapping type tool but you have to be able to engage at least two threads or you can put a nut on the back of it and this is the preferred method to just oftentimes I'll use a tapping tool and put a nut on the back of it. So this is going to give you the strongest mechanical connection. So you, you know, go ahead and drill your hole or go ahead and tap your hole, then screw it in, then put a nut on the back of it. So it's just one of those things. That's how you can attach those. There's really only two methods unless you're using another listed piece. I would avoid using any type of clamp on or bang on apparatus. You're going to want to see a strong mechanical connection because you're only going to be there one time bonding this pool. You're not going to be back checking on it, checking on the bond anyways. We got to make sure that this thing is super robust the very first time. Well, this was a very basic video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any questions about it, drop it down in the comments below. I just want to see you guys win. And if there's anything that I can ever do to help you in life or business, you can always email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com.
And I want to thank you guys for joining us. Please never, never, never be like these guys right here. I don't care if you want to have a fun time around the pool, but never, under any circumstance, do something wild like this. Let's get to it.